uh, compare in particular the Austrian position on uh, law and economics and uh, briefly at least the basic principles of the Chicago view on law and economics. Um, I should make you aware of the fact that in one of the latest issues of the Journal of Libertarian Studies uh, there is an, uh, an important article on the Chicago law and economics tradition by Gary, by Gary North. So you might want to pick up the JLS, which is, by the way, the most interesting journal there is. Uh, it was founded by Murray Rosebart, and I'm currently the, the, author, the editor of it. Um, you, you will see it is, it is an exciting interdisciplinary journal. Uh, you would tend to read almost every article in it, which is a rare event for journals. Um, in any case, so um, the Austrian tradition uh, in law and economics uh, has basically been um, introduced and founded by Rothbard. That is, so to speak, Rothbard's contribution uh, above and beyond what he has done in uh, economics, where most of the stuff that he presents he, of course, inherited from, uh, from Mises. So let me begin with the um, Austrian view on on law and economics, um, or we can also say ethics and economics. Um, I want to make you aware first of the preconditions that must exist in order for people to have any ethical or legal or moral problems. Um, if you imagine one person alone on earth, uh, the question of right or wrong behavior w would not really arise. Um, but if you have uh, two individuals, um, then of course uh, it becomes possible that uh, individuals have conflicts. And uh, what conflicts are, let me just first explain that by considering um, uh, the Garden of Eden as our first type of world, the simplest type of world, which is characterized by superabundance of of everything. And we have uh, Friday and Crusoe in the Garden of Eden. Now it should be clear that over most of the things that exist in the Garden of Eden, it would not be possible to have any conflicts. If I take a banana uh, that neither sub subtracts from my future supply of banana, nor does it take away anything from the banana supply for, for somebody else. So there would never be conflicts over bananas. Uh, the same with respect to all sorts of other goods, simply by assumption that there is superabundance in existence. Um, however, even in the Garden of Eden, uh, two, two, two goods are, so to speak, scarce, and over two goods, uh, conflicts could arise. Um, the one is simply our phys own physical body. Um, that is, uh, uh, I might want to do something to my physical body, but somebody else might also want to do something to my physical body. Or I might want to do something to somebody else's physical body. Um, so it is possible that Friday and Crusoe can get in a conflict over yeah, who should control their bodies. Um, and secondly, their standing room is scarce. That is, when I stand on this place, uh, and nobody else can stand at this specific place, and if he wants to stand at this specific place, th then again we have a conflict at hand. Um, now the purpose of ethics or of law is uh, to formulate rules that make it possible uh, to avoid otherwise unavoidable conflicts regarding scarce resources. You realize only over scarce resources are conflicts possible. Uh, and only with respect to scarce resources do we then need some sort of rules that help us to deal with this particular problem. 
Now, in the Garden of Eden, it would be relatively simple to just propose some rules that almost everybody would intuitively accept. Um, and I will give afterwards some more rigorous defenses of them, but let's start out with intuition. So how would we regulate social relationships in the Garden of Eden with the possibility of these two types of conflicts that I have described? Now the answer seems to be, uh, we make it a rule that I am the owner of my body, uh, have exclusive control over my body, and you are the exclusive owner of your body and have exclusive control over your body. And if you want to do something to my body, you can only do it if you have my invitation. And I can do something to your body only if you give me invitation to do it. Uh, and the other rule is, you can move around in the Garden of Eden wherever you want, except to a place where somebody is already standing. Uh, and if he moves away, then of course you can occupy that space too. You realize that if people would follow these rules, no conflict would result in the Garden of Eden. And again, this is the purpose of rules, uh, like we can say even more precisely, of property rules. Because what we need in order to avoid conflicts over scarce resources are of course rules that make the ownership of these resources exclusive to one party and not another. It must be clear who is allowed to do something with the resource and who is not allowed to do something with the resource. And that is precisely what property rights do, of course. So now we expand the world to the real world, uh, jump out of the uh, Garden of Eden, and uh, what is the fundamental difference between uh, the Garden of Eden and and the real world uh, is no more and no less than the fact that, in the gar that outside of the Garden of Eden there exists all around scarcity. Um, uh, innumerable, innumerable, innumerable things are uh, scarce and of course accordingly uh, there can be conflicts uh, over uh, countless, uh, countless of things. The task that we face is exactly the same. To formulate rules that make it possible that otherwise unavoidable conflict over the use of scarce resources can be conceivably avoided. And I will give you, again, first a set of rules that has been developed over uh, centuries. There's nothing brand new in this. Uh, a set of rules uh, that I would claim can be justified as the only set of rules solving this type of problem that I described. I will give you the rules first and then I will give you various justifications for it. The first rule is the rule of uh, self, self ownership. means every person owns itself. That was the rule that I already formulated for the Garden of Eden. The second rule is the rule concerning original appropriation. How do people for the first time acquire property in previously unowned resources? Um, and the answer is by being the first one uh, to put these things to some productive use, to do something with them, or the, in the terms of John Locke, those who mix their labor for the first time with previously unowned nature-given resources. This is also, also sometimes referred to as the homesteading rule. You become the owner of something having exclusive control over it by being the very first one to take it into possession. All other rules follow from it. I will just briefly list them, however. Next one we can call producer rule or production rule. Producer owns pro product. Producer owns product. Now, this follows from the previous two. If I am a self-owner and 
if I, with the help of my body, have for the first time appropriated resources that were previously unowned, then by combining these two things, by engaging in productive efforts, I become the owner of what I have produced. And the final rule is the only other way to acquire exclusive rights over scarce resources, the only other way, instead of uh, original appropriation and production, is uh, I can acquire property in things also through contract or through voluntary exchange from a previous owner. If I am the previous owner of what I have produced, included in this right would be the right, of course, to give this thing away, either for a price or as a uh, present to somebody else, provided that the exchange is a voluntary one, that is, uh, the owner of the resource agrees to its being sold or its being given away. Okay. Um, Now, let me make you aware of the fact, of course, that intuitively uh, most people would accept these sorts of rules uh, uh, immediately and most people follow them in their daily lives, of, of course. Um, as far as the homesteading rule is concerned, for instance, you, even when little children fight over whose toy is it, uh, it tends to be... The, the, the decisive argument tends to be I played with the toy first so I should be allowed to continue playing with it <laughs> until I, I, I until I abandon it so to speak and then it is open for new homesteading uh, again um, and even in, in, in primitive tribes you have a clear-cut conception of uh, I am the owner of my own body and uh, what was first uh, first appropriated should belong to the first appropriator and uh, and so forth. Just also in order to emphasize the intuition of all of this, just try to formulate the opposite, and I will go through that in a in a moment. Um, so what we need, however, besides intuition, is of course some sort of ri rigorous defense of these rules and the defense of the claim uh, that no alternative uh, rules uh, can claim to be just and fair. Um, there are two strategies that we can use in order to defend these rules. The first one is um, we simply assume the opposite. And there exist two opposites of this one. Uh, one would be the option of slavery um, I own you, but you don't own me, instead of I own myself and you own yourself. That's one possible alternative. Um, or the other one is called universal communism. That is the idea, I own one-fiftieth part of you, or whatever the total group is, and you own one-fiftieth part of me. Um, if we consider... This, this alternative uh, of slavery, um, the fundamental problem in philosophical terms is um, that such a norm uh, is not universalizable. That is, it is not a norm that equally applies to all people. It is an ethic of superman and subhuman, so to speak. Um, and all rules that aspire to the rank of an ethical rule should be universalizable, that is, apply, so to speak, to all cases. Um, so we can uh, eliminate that because it does not fulfill the universalizable criterion. Not everyone could reasonably agree to such a thing. Uh, universal communism uh, does fulfill this universalizable uh, criterion um, because it makes no distinction between different individuals. I own a part of you and you own a part of me. No distinctions of any unfair kind 
uh, are being made. But the, the problem with this uh, universal communism is even greater than with slavery. In the case of slavery, we can at least imagine that slavery can be implemented. As a matter of fact, of course, we know that slavery has existed at many places, so that is a, at least a viable system. Um, universal communism is not even a viable system that cannot even be implemented for the following reason. Um, if I want to do anything with my body, but I am only a part owner of my body, what would be required for me to do what I want to do? You, you would have to agree to it, because you are also owner of my body. You are a part owner, so you must agree to it. But can you agree to it? I mean, what is necessary in order for you to say, I agree to it? That again, you must have, so to speak, exclusive control over your body that you use in order to say, I agree to it. But, but, but you don't have exclusive control over your body. That is, you would have to ask me if you can say, I permit you here with, to do such and such. And that indicates clearly that nobody could ever do anything, so mankind would instantly die out if we were to adopt this type of system. This is the first way of showing that only this system remains um, intact. Um, we can go through the same, the same idea here with with original appropriation. We just uh, briefly do that also. The other alternative would be, uh, not the first one gets it, but somebody else gets it, who has not homesteaded it. Um, whereas, uh, uh, whereas, yeah, this, the, 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 second comer, uh, the second comer gets it, instead of the first, the first comer. Uh, what, what problem would arise if we were to adopt uh, a rule such as that? Yeah. And, and nobody could, again, begin to act at all because it's only the second comer who has any rights to, to things. But obviously mankind must be able to start somehow. And it can only start if indeed the first comer has the right to just use things that are nature given. So, Slavery does not fulfill the universalization criterion. This one does, but this is fatal if we adopt it. There remains only this system, which is universalizable. There's no distinction made between different individuals. It applies to all people exactly in the same, in the same way. And mankind can survive if we act according to these principles. That is, you can easily see that, that human life can exist with these rules in, uh, intact. Now another way of showing these rules to be justifiable is um, in making you aware of a second requirement that must be fulfilled in order to have any ethical problems. You recall the first one was we must have scarcity. Um, the second requirement that uh, I have only used implicitly so far is the following. Imagine that you have a conflict with a mosquito or a gorilla. Um, the conflict is, of course, also over scarce resources, right? I mean, the, uh, the gorilla wants to eat you up, uh, and, uh, and the mosquito wants to sit on your arm, and you don't want it to sit on your arm. Um, now, in this case, would we, however, speak of a moral or legal or ethical problem? And the answer is, uh, no, obviously not. Um, the problem that we have here is merely a technical problem, right? I mean, this is, this is a solution to one of the problems, and uh, un otherwise we have to just fight it out with the gorilla. We have to learn to either kill it or tame it. Um, uh, in any case, it makes no sense, so to speak, to ask the gorilla, how dare you try to eat me here? Uh, didn't your parents teach you any better, or things of that nature? <laughs> Neither does it make sense to have a conversation with flies or mosquitoes. Um, so it should be perfectly clear, then, what the second requirement is in order to have any ethical problems. 
The second requirement is that we must in principle be able to engage in propositional exchange that two entities that have the conflict with each other must be able to engage in propositional exchange. I say deliberately propositional exchange, rather they must talk to each other, because it is also possible to have propositional exchange, for instance, between people who speak different languages. So you can translate one language in the other, you can learn different languages and so forth. But you must be able to communicate in the sense with each other that you that you can make truth claims, that you can say, this is right or this is wrong, uh, give me your arguments, these are my arguments, and things of that sort. And you can see that this is, that is an absolutely necessary requirement for ha having ethical problems. Um, because if you would argue against it, if you would say, I'm wrong in making this claim, you yourself would obviously have to make an argument to do so and admit, so to speak, that that is the absolutely necessary requirement in order for two entities to engage in some sort of ethical, moral, legal uh, dispute. Uh, some people have called that because of this, the a priori of argumentation. You cannot choose another starting point except argumentation, because anybody else would, so to speak, not exist as a reasonable person. And being able to engage in propositional exchange is a characteristic of having rationality. Now, now one can show in the next step that in order to make it possible to argue with each other and try to clarify what is or is not true, uh, simply in order to engage in an argument, we must... Uh, we must, take, must take, take certain things for granted. We must accept, so to speak, certain norms. Uh, and these norms then obviously can no longer be disputed in an argument insofar as they are the necessary requirement for engaging in any argument. Now, what are these uh, necessary requirements for engaging in an argument. Uh, they are precisely that the arguing persons uh, respect each other's property right in their own bodies. I must be able to say what I'm saying and you must be able to reply to what I say and we assume, as long as we are engaged in argument, that I can persuade somebody of my reasoning only by virtue of my argumentative power. I do not grab his hairs and convince him of my argument. Um, mere words must, must accomplish this. And that assumes that I own myself and can produce these words freely and you own yourself and can produce your words freely. So there we have them. Uh, Self-ownership is impossible to deny as a valid rule in an argument with a claim that that is true, a stu true statement that can be, in principle, be agreed to by everyone. That's impossible to do. Self-ownership is a necessary presupposition of any type of argumentation and beca because of that is ethically justified. Then we would have to go from self-ownership to original appropriation. There the argument runs something like this. If we would not have the right to appropriate anything except our own bodies, then mankind would die out. That would obviously not be a viable ethics. So it must be permitted that we appropriate things other than ourselves. Then it's only the question, how do we appropriate them? And there exist basically only two possibilities. Either we appropriate them through action, that is in the form of original appropriation, or we appropriate them through declaration, saying this, I, I declare that I'm the owner of it. Now, if you assume the position of uh, 
you can uh, declare, declare yourself the owner of something. That's usually how governments come into possession of things. They simply declare, as far as the eye can see, this is now all property of the United States. Um, you realize the problem with property can be acquired through declaration does not work because then we have the problem again that there might be different declarations. They are incompatible declarations. So he says, as far as the eye can see, it's all mine. And I say, exactly, as far as the eye can see, it's all mine, however. Um, so that would not even be a technically uh, sufficient uh, solution to the problem of avoiding conflicts. In the matter, as a matter of fact, that would generate conflicts, such a rule. On the other hand, if property is acquired through individual action, then it is always a specific tie that exists between a specific individual and a specific object that has been uh, appropriated. And we have objective signs for this fact that this guy has, in fact, a contact with this object. And conflicts because of that can be easily, um, easily avoided. Now, a few frequently made misunderstandings about, um, about the, these rules. Um, first, let me emphasize that property rights only extend uh, to the physical integrity of things, um, never to the value of things. Um, and only physical damage done to the property of others is, so to speak, an offense that needs to be punished, not, however, actions that only lead to a change in the value of things owned by others. To give you, to give you an example, um, a store opens next door from me, sells the same sort of goods as I sell, what is bound to happen to the value of my store? Uh, it will likely fall. Uh, is this an aggressive act? Um, and I want to show that that is not aggr an aggressive act and that we would get in deep, deep trouble if we considered those things ever to be an aggressive act. Um, this is a mere value change. On the other hand, if I go to the neighboring store and damage his goods, um, then of course this would be a physical invasion, would be an offense uh, that deserves to be punished. To show the absurdity of believing that you own the value of things, uh, let me give you the following example. If, uh, if I'm on the labor market and negotiating with an employer um, and another laborer comes, uh, this other laborer, of course, affects the value that I have in these uh, labor negotiations. Uh, if this guy would have committed, so to speak, aggression against me, the second person appearing there, then I must be, of course, entitled to defend myself against such an aggressor. aggressor. Um, that is, whenever somebody had the feeling that his value in some dimension was diminished by the existence of somebody else, he would have the right uh, to punish or, if need be, execute, eliminate this person who diminishes his, uh, his value. Uh, if you are on the marriage market and a second person enters the marriage market and yet chances are gone, uh, then this person allegedly has committed an aggression and you would be entitled to physically defend himself against his existence, if need be, eliminating him. So, to think that one can have property rights in the value of things instead of the physical integrity gets you into deep difficulties. The second, the second point that I uh, want to make is uh, in situations where people have conflicts with, with each other, it is very important to, to know about the temporal genesis of uh, property rights how they came into being and who was the first and who was the second owner and so forth. Let me just give you an example of this. Let's say I move to this place and I have no neighbors around as far as the eye can see and I produce now something uh, that produces fallout, let's say smoke. And the smoke falls on the ground uh, outside of my, what I consider my property. 
damage occurred there. Um, now, somebody else moves into my neighborhood, who was before not in sight, and uh, complains about the smoke landing on his, on landing on his lawn. Um, in this case, it is decisive to recognize that this person here, by being there first and not having initially damaged anybody, has established an easement. That is, he is permitted to continue with this activity um, because this activity was right for him to do at the very beginning. The complaint of this one, of this person, uh, is not a valid complaint. What he actually appropriated, when he appropriated, was soiled ground. Uh, and he has no right to ask this person to re remove uh, the, uh, um, the substances uh, that are under question there from, from his property. If the situation would have been the other way around, that is, uh, this person lived here first, and now the factory owner is moving in. Um, and now he emits smoke out of his factory, and then it hits the ground. Then, of course, we would judge the case exactly the other way around. We would say, these people had appropriated clean land, and this guy, the latecomer, he then soiled the land, so obviously these people have a right that this be stopped or that the dirt be removed. So it is of importance, so to speak, who established their rights first, who acquired easements. In this case here, this person acquired an easement to continue with activities that in that situation would be considered to be uh, uh, crime, tort, or whatever the appropriate term uh, is in a case like this. Um, now a few words about the economics of all of this. You're familiar with the so-called Pareto criterion that says if we cannot measure utility, but utility is ordinal, then we can only speak of an increase in social utility if it is the case that uh, at least one person must gain and no one must lose. Uh, or all people must gain and no one must, or most people must gain and no one must lose. But we cannot speak of an increase in social utility if the utility of one person increases and that of another person decreases because we cannot compare the magnitudes given that they are not measurable. So now I want to show that in a certain interpretation that is not the interpretation that is usually given to the Pareto criterion, but in a certain interpretation we can show that following these rules always produces what we can call Pareto superior states of affairs. States of affairs where at least one person gains and nobody loses. And so yet every step along these rules, so to speak, would produce a further Pareto superior state of affairs. Um, if we begin with self-ownership, it is perfectly clear that um, uh, if both individuals are, so to speak, uh, self-owners, that this is a um, Pareto superior uh, state of affairs. They both they both gain from uh, from this state of affairs. Um, if we look to original appropriation, uh, who gained from original appropriation? The original appropriator. He would not have appropriated it unless he thought that that would make him better off. Now the question, is anybody harmed by the decision to give uh, this piece of land that was first appropriate to the first appropriator? Now in some interpretation you might say yes, but not in the following interpretation. Uh, everybody else was perfectly entitled to appropriate the same piece of land. Right? It was initially unowned. Did, however, they do this? The answer is no. Only one did it. What do the others then demonstrate in their actions? That they did not attach value to this thing. Otherwise, they would have appropriated it. 
So we can say the first appropriator gains and nobody loses. Nothing has been taken away from others. Others have not recognized this as scarce and valuable, otherwise they could have appropriated just the same. But they didn't. Producer. The producer obviously gains, otherwise he would not produce. The purpose of production is to turn something less valuable into something that is more valuable. Uh, if we assume that the producer in the process of production does not damage the property of others, what happens to the rest of the world as a result of the producer's action is everybody else owns exactly the same amount as they did before. Nothing has been taken away from them. Again, Pareto superior move. One person gains, nobody loses. And of course, in a contract, in a voluntary exchange, it's actually the case that both contracting partners gain, at least ex ante. Um, otherwise, they would not have done the exchange. And as for the rest of the world, the properties of the rest of the world are simply not affected by this. So that would be, again, a Pareto superior move. You can also very intuitively, of course, immediately recognize in which way that yeah, the in which way that increases the production of wealth. Imagine just that the original appropriator would not be granted sole property ship over it. Um, yeah, that would that would the discovery of scarce valuable res resources would would slow down or come to a complete halt. Uh, imagine the producer would not get the full value of his product. Will that promote productivity? Uh, of course not. Uh, and imagine voluntary contracts would not be recognized as legitimate, but you could at any time interfere with this sort of stuff. Um, so it's perfectly clear that these rules also are extremely important when it comes to simply the economic, uh, the economic functioning of, uh, of a society. So now I want to come to, um, come to the Chicago School which takes a very, uh, very different, different line, a different approach. As a matter of fact, the Chicago School's view on property, as you will recognize, can be regarded as the most dangerous attack on private property since the demise of communism. Um, yeah, that, you might think that is, uh, of course, the hoppy and hyperbole or something like this. <laughs> um, but um, I'm almost certain that you will agree with me uh, once you hear me out. I will, um, of course, in order uh, not to give you the impression that I might be unfair to the Chicago people, I will provide you with a, a few quotes in this case. In just, that, just that I'm not cheating you here. Um, let's begin with, uh, with Coase, who is probably the most famous figure in law and economics in the Chicago, in the Chicago tradition. Um, and let's consider a case that he discusses over and over again, and I'll show you first how the Austrians would solve it, and then I'll give you his answer to how to solve this case. Um, so we have a, a railroad that runs beside some farm uh, with some wheat fields on there. And uh, the engine emits sparks and the sparks set fire to the wheat and the wheat burns down. Um, so a conflict ensues between the farmer and the rail and the railroad. They go to court. So what is the court to decide in this case? Now, before I come to the Chicago answer, this is kind of funny. Um, let me just emphasize again: how would how would Austrians solve this case? Now they would, of course, say that depends on who was there first, right? Um, if the railroad was there first and emitted sparks all along and there was nothing adjacent to it uh, and then the farmer came later on and built his field right next to the 
uh, railroad track there and the farm, the, the plugs, or the sparks went over there, uh, then we would say the farmer then has to pay the railroad to prevent that these sparks happen. On the other hand, if the farmer was there first and there was no railroad there before and then the railroad comes and now it emits sparks, then the farmer can say, I appropriated land that was spark-free. Now it is no longer spark-free. You are the one who is, so to speak, the aggressor uh, and you have to pay me for the damage that you caused me. So the Austrians have a very simple approach to this. It depends uh, in which way the property, various property rights involved were established. Now how does coal solve this problem? So coal, and I have to go slow because sometimes that is hard to believe. <laughs> Coase thinks that it is wrong to think of the farmer and the railroad as either right or wrong. He takes, so to speak, a relativistic position. I'm not sure who is right and wrong in this case, uh, who is the aggressor and who is the victim. And now the quote directly from him. The question is commonly thought of as one in which A inflicts harm on B and what has to be decided is how should we restrain A. But this is wrong. We are dealing with a problem of a reciprocal nature. To avoid the harm to B would be to inflict harm on A. The real question that has to be decided is should A be allowed to harm B or should B be allowed to harm A? The problem is to avoid the more serious harm. Now, what I have done is taking this quotation and just have put in some real incidences. And then you will see what you get. Uh, take the case of A raping B. Okay? It's a conflict. It's just like in the farmer other cases. It just becomes more, more drastic when you just hear cases applied to this wonderful legal advice that we get from Mr. Coase. So, uh, A is raping B. According to Coase, and now I use his own words, uh, A is not necessarily supposed to be restrained. Rather, we are dealing with a problem of a reciprocal nature. In preventing A from raping B, harm is inflicted on A because he can no longer rape freely. <laughs> the real question is, should A be allowed to rape B, or should B be allowed to prohibit A from raping him? The problem is to avoid the more serious harm. Okay? And that, of course... Uh, is a judge that decides then to whom the more serious harm has occurred. And as you will see in the following, and the answer to this question is not at all clear. You know, so, I mean, you, then you have to have, have some st standard to evaluate how big harm is on that side and how big harm is on that. Uh, as, as, assume, for instance, that, uh, that the, I mean, in, it, it, you will see that later on more clearly. In the Chicago style tradition, it would be something like this. Let's say the woman who is being raped um, would be a professional prostitute. Uh, whereas the other, the, the, the rapee is, uh, is a person who had been incarcerated for a long time in, in, in prison or so. Now then, a, a Chicago judge could say, yeah, if we just balance the harm, if this guy who came out of jail and cannot get immediately sex, he, he is tremendous, tremendously harmed if he would outlaw from raping her. On the other hand, the woman being a professional prostitute does it uh, on a regular basis anyway, so what's the big deal? There's very little harm, so it should be permitted. Um, on the other hand, so to speak, if, if you just put instead of the prostitute, you put a Catholic nun in, then you might get the other, the opposite results. So, uh, the legal decision become very fluid in the hands of uh, Chicago judges, as you will see from um, from the next examples that I 
that I have to offer. Um, for instance, Posner. Um, Posner's view, and that is similar to uh, Coase's, is um, justice is every act that increases wealth. Injustice is an act that decreases wealth. Um, accordingly, for instance, if you have the following, the following case, a factory emits smoke and thereby lowers residential property values. But that's the case. Factory emits smoke, residential property values are lowered. If property values are lowered by $3 million and the plant location is $2 million, uh, then the plant should be held liable and should be forced to relocate. Okay? Damage is in this case uh, greater than the relocation cost. Yet if the numbers are reversed, that is, property values fall by 2 million and relocation costs are 3 million, the factory can stay open and continue to emit smoke. So you re what you realize is depending on different external circumstances, you can be either liable or not liable for the same type of, uh, same type of offense. Uh, you realize also that these circumstances can of course change independent of what you yourself do. The external circumstances can change and change this, this scenario around with the 2 million and 3 million case, in which case you first assign property rights, let's say, to, uh, to the village, and, 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 and two months later you assign property rights to, um, uh, to the factory, uh, factory owner. Um, Let's address the question, if such a rule that assigns property rights always in such a way uh, that wealth will be maximized. Let me ask, give you first another example. Um, I, have, I have a wallet um, uh, and you claim that you are the owner of the wallet. Um, if we go to the judge and I appear as a bum, who will use all my money only to get drunk t tonight, whereas you appear to be a person who is uh, ambitious and uh, plans to do investments with this, who then, according to Chicago lawyers, should get property rights in this thing, in my wallet? You should get property rights in it because you do something that increases wealth, whereas what I do would decrease wealth. I, des I destroy all sorts of liquor bottles, uh, whereas you might build liquor bottles. Um, again, it would be a reciprocal harm, right? Uh, if you are prevented from stealing my wallet out of my pocket, this is harm done to you. Right? Now, is it true? that if we have a rule such as this, property rights should be always allocated in such a way that they result in the maximum production of wealth. Would such a rule, in fact, produce the maximum amount of wealth? Well, the answer seems to be quite clear. Of course not. Because such a rule means property rights are never once and for all secure assigned to anyone. You can never be secure in your own property right. The only thing that has to be discovered that there is somebody who can make better use of what you thought was your property than you yourself. And then you are right for a redistribution of income. In other words, the Chicago people do not recognize the existence of property rights at all. Those are just temporary privileges that you have until the cir circumstances change in such a way that these privileges should be assigned to somebody else. Now I want to give you some truly hilarious implications of this. I take that from Posner. 
Um, remember, wealth, production of wealth is a just act, and if you decrease the production of wealth, that is unjust. And now this. We may be reasonably confident, Posner says, that the American people would be poorer if Henry Ford had, de had decided to become a Trappist monk rather than the automobile manufacturer that we know him to have been. So from this it would then follow uh, to enslave Ford uh, so th that he would indeed become the type of Ford uh, and maximize wealth. If he holds out and is a Trappist monk, he commits an in unjust act. He reduces wealth while he would be capable of enhancing wealth. So in this case, if we want to fulfill the Chicago ambition of maximizing wealth, we have to enslave him and just drag him to the uh, assembly line there and, and play the real Henry Ford. Similarly, again, quote here, if there is a taste for pure solitude, that is, for seclusion unrelated to social interaction, this is a selfish emotion. Solitary activity benefits only the actor. Work, on the other hand, confers benefits on others. There is thus a sense in which the person who works is unselfish, while the individual who retires from the world reduces his contribution to the wealth of other people in society. What is the conclusion that we should draw from that? That guy, of course, also is ripe for enslavement. Right? He, he acts unjustly and we can make him act just if he only produces, uh, produces more wealth. Do I have, still have some minutes here? Then I have one... one uh, I have some, right? Okay. In that case, I give you one more uh, funny, <laughs> funny example here. Um, so now these Posner people have, of course, a problem. How do we assign rights in the very beginning? So at the moment when mankind begins. Um, And there he says the following. The problem of the initial assignment of rights um, that should be also wealth maximizing, but initially, of course, no one would have anything with which to maximize wealth. So how to decide this? Posner writes, but suppose no goods are yet owned. Land, labor, sexual access. Here you see that I'm not exaggerating with this prostitution example. Sexual access is also not owned yet. It's questionable who owns and doesn't own it. That switches around depending on different circumstances. Um, all rights have yet to be assigned. Assignment of rights on so massive a scale is bound to affect prices and prices in turn will affect the question of whom the rights should be assigned to. Yeah, that leaves us obviously somewhat in the dark here. Um, then he says, uh, then he tried to, tried to dis downplay this problem. He said, the initial distribution of wealth will eventually cease to have an important effect on the society's aggregate of wealth. After, after 300 years, that, that might be no longer a problem. But, I mean, what do we do with the people who live in these first 300 years before the things have not really worked themselves out yet? Um, in that event, we can ask the question, what initial assignment of rights would most quickly move society to its eventual wealth level? And the answer that he gives is, uh, that is, by assigning labor rights to their natural owners, we can't even deny that there ex exists something like this, to their natural owners, and splitting up land into the smallest parcels in which the available economies of scale can be exploited 
and transaction costs will be minimized and so, so thus moves the society more rapidly to the level it would eventually reach anyway even if all rights were initially assigned to one man. So you realize, he said, yeah, maybe it might be plausible then to recognize that there are people who own themselves, their natural rights, but that is by no means necessarily the case. It is just, maybe, maybe we should do this. And then he discusses, in fact, uh, what would be the case if we do, don't do that. Um, so here, as he asked, what would happen if we just assign that to, uh, to one man? Um, okay, so if, let's say we assign uh, all rights to one individual and, and any other person would simply have no resources by means of which he could uh, uh, attach value to, uh, to anything. Um, now he writes, if transaction costs are positive, uh, the wealth maximization principle requires the initial vesting of rights in those who are likely to value them most, so as to minimize transaction costs. I mean, how difficult that is to determine who likes them most. This is the economic reason for giving a worker the right to sell his labor and the woman the right to determine her sexual partners. If assigned randomly to strangers, these rights would generally, but not invariably, be repurchased by the worker and the woman. Um, but it would be required, of course, that they have to repurchase them. Um, the cost of rectifying transaction can be avoided if the right is assigned at the outset to the user who values it most. Similarly, there is no mechanism for initially identifying and vesting the right in someone who in fact values it so highly that he might not resell it to the natural owner. The inherent difficulties of borrowing against human capital, that is, if you own nothing, and have no rights, all the rights were assigned to somebody else, then you can imagine that you have difficulties borrowing money to buy, to buy your rights uh, back, right? I mean, you, you, own, you own damn nothing of yourself. Um, so the inherent difficulties of borrowing against human capital would no doubt defeat some efforts by the natural owners to buy back the right to his labor or body, even from someone who did not really value it more highly than he did. But that is simply a further reason for initially vesting the rights in the natural owner. Um, again, um, what I wanted to get across in, in all this is, in the Austrian tradition, law and ethics precedes economics. Uh, and the bridge between ethics and economics is the concept of private property. But the concepts that we already presuppose in economics, like an exchange, a voluntary exchange, requires already that we must have a clear-cut grasp of what, what property rights are. So ethics comes before economics, conceptually. In the Chicago tradition, ethics and law comes after economics, that is, after wealth-maximizing uh, goals. In the Austrian tradition, there exist clear-cut assigned property rights in all situations. Um, and property, there cannot be any changes in the assignment of property rights except through transfer from one person to another. In the Chicago tradition, property rights are not fixed once and for all. They are flexible. They are subordinate to a higher goal. The higher goal is wealth maximization. But if they are assigned flexibly to people, depending on who in what particular situation will maximize wealth or will not maximize wealth, one can predict that, of course, a society will not be very wealthy, in which this is the case. As a last thing, I want to read you, to show you somehow the...
somewhat absurd nature here of this Chicago approach. I see I have should find that quotation quickly. Here. Posner on on absolute uh, and not absolute rights. Absolute rights play an important role in the economic theory of the law. But when transaction costs are prohibitive, the recognition of absolute rights is inefficient. Property rights, although absolute, are contingent on transaction costs and subservient or instrumental to the goal of wealth maximization. I mean, that sentence you have to just go through several times. So, property rights, although absolute, are contingent on transaction cost and subservient to the instrumental uh, or instrumental to the goal of wealth maximization. Now, in, in the world of a normal person, that means absolute rights are not absolute. <laughs> um, but in Chicago economics, you can get away with things like that. Thank you.